All right, Timmy's going to be preaching this morning, and so if you don't mind, when he comes up, we're going to reach our hands out, and we're going to pray for him so that we can encourage him in what he has prepared. Yeah? Okay. Do you mind reaching your hands out, and we'll pray for Timmy. Father God, we just thank you for Timmy. We thank you for the word that he has prepared. Open our hearts and our minds to what you have to say to us through him this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amazing. Thanks, Kirst. Good morning, Shadwell. You know this by now. Good morning, Shadwell. Much better. All right, just need to get back in. Um, as always, it is a joy and privilege to be with you. Um, it's a great joy to be one of your church wardens along with Kirsten. Um, and great to get to deliver God's word to you this morning, especially on a potentially history-making day like today, when the lionesses of England face La Roja de España uh, for the World Cup crown. Um, and we've just about tried to time everything so that you should be able to, you might miss the national anthem, we should just about meet the first minute or so of, of the World Cup final if you're wanting to go across. Or the band will come back up and we'll be able to worship and pray and reflect together as well in here. So, uh, yeah, two great options <laughs> for, for after my, my talk. Um, but last week we reveled at the story of Jesus walking on water. Um, Philip had talked about how this can be a great example of faith and consistently trusting in God. Um, but today's passage is one that you probably didn't hear much at Sunday school. Um, it's not the most child-friendly for two reasons. One, it talks about not washing your hands before you eat, which I'm sure every parent would hate for their child to hear. And, and then secondly, it also talks about what some people might describe as, as kind of grown-up sins. Um, but it's a fascinating exchange between Jesus and the Pharisees, who were like leaders in the synagogue at the time. And we can navigate it from start to finish to extract all of the juicy bits that Jesus had to share. Now, last time I was up here um, talking about choosing the good soil, I forgot to remind you all to take notes. And we all know taking notes in church helps you get into heaven faster when you get to the gates. So here's your warning. Uh, we're going to be going reading from Matthew chapter 15, um, and Dave Cakebread is, is going to come and deliver that to us. Uh, but if you did miss anything from the last couple, oh, no, keep coming. If you did miss anything from the last couple of sermons, we do also have them all on YouTube. And I've also heard that we're on Spotify as well. Is that right? Yeah, so you can listen to my voice on Spotify. I feel quite... Oh, sorry. I look, look forward to listening to your voice on Spotify. Um, so the reading is from Matthew 15, um, verses 1 to 20. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, and why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father or mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Then the disciples came to him and asked, do you know, what the Pharisees were, uh, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? He replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them, they are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Peter said, explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. This is the word of the Lord. 
Brilliant. Thanks, Dave. Punchy, punchy passage. Now, uh, when I was at secondary school, there was a key question that came up amongst our U group every, every couple of years or so that could literally define your school experience. Like, it could take you from zero to hero in an instant. It could make you the most popular person on the playground. It, it could just set up your status as a school kid. Now, can anyone guess what that question was? I know you're not going to get it, but have a guess. What football team do you support? Nope, not that one. What's your favorite color? <laughs> We're deeper than that. We're deeper than that. Someone said something about trainers. What make your trainers? What make your trainers? That's, a, that's a good guess. That's a good guess. It was along those kind of lines. Now, the question was, and I knew you weren't going to get it. What did you get on the bleep test? <laughs> Oof. That's a serious question. Now, for those who don't know, this is what the bleep test is. The bleep test is a fitness test that basically involves running between two lines that are like 15, 20 meters apart, and you have to hit each line on the bleep. So you basically have to be able to, yeah, there's the bleep. So you have to be able to keep up with the time of the bleep, but if it's too fast for you, then you drop out. But each level, the bleep gets faster and more frequent. So you see this guy here, he's kind of slowing down, he's struggling to keep up. This is the police, by the way. This is like a police fitness video and they can't get past level four, so I'm a bit concerned. So he misses the bleep and gets eliminated, right? Now a good score, it's maybe like level 12, level 15. The, the famous footballer David Beckham could apparently do the bleep test, and it starts at level one, goes up to level 21. He could go all the way to level 21, which basically means you're sprinting between each bleep, and then he would do it back down to zero again, which is nuts. Uh, it's like doing 10K of running in about 45 minutes, but with sprints and turns and everything in between. Like, I'm, I'm getting sweaty just thinking about it. Um, but the bleep test is actually also a great leveler because you don't need to be you know, technically brilliant at football or really skillful with your hands to be able to run at a good pace. Like, like fitness can be almost universal. So, so that's where you know, like the maths genius at school, who no one expected much from, could come storming through and get a level 16, and he'll be the most popular kid at school for like a year because we're like, wow, you're Superman, amazing. Um, and, and it's because the test isn't interested in the skills of your hands and feet. It's, it's designed to check the condition of your lungs and the condition of your heart. And that's where I feel Jesus was at in, in Matthew chapter 15. He was calling on the Pharisees to, to almost do like a, a spiritual bleep test. You know, to really look at where their health was in their heart. Really look at where the condition of their heart was. You know, the heart is mentioned in the Bible over a thousand times but not often in the physiological sense, more typically in the kind of spiritual sense, thinking about where your emotions and your desires reside. That's how Jesus often talked about the heart. You know, both are typically directed by your motives or your motivations. Uh, and so Jesus is interested in what the driving force is behind our actions. You know, what makes us do what we do or say what we say. You know, Jesus wants us to check your heart. Let's look at this fascinating and, and sometimes hilarious exchange from start to finish. Starting at verse 1. Um, then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. And Jesus replied, Why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? So there are two key phrases in this opening volley that, that show the difference in priorities between the Pharisees and where Jesus expects us to be, right? Um, the Pharisees care about the tradition of the elders, whilst Jesus is more focused on the command of God. Those are quite different. For context, back, back in the book of um, Exodus and, and also in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, Moses was leading the Israelites out of Egypt and starting to give them instructions on how they should live and honor God. And because God is so clean and perfect and holy, there was a particular focus on cleanliness, which is where this kind of had its root. 
But down the years, the clear instructions that God had given were added to by the leaders or the elders of the times uh, and made even more nitpicky. So things like ceremonial washing before eating had become tradition, despite not actually being commanded by God. And such things could sometimes be used to, to kind of create a separation between the people and God, that they were unclean. Uh, which is not what God really intended or desired. And, you know, Jesus refused to allow things like that to be a blocker. He wants us to come to him no matter what, any time, you know, whether, whether we've washed our hands or not. He wants us to come whether we've had a perfect week as a Christian or not. You know, we can come and meet with Jesus as we are, with warts, insecurities, all our mistakes, no matter what it is. He has already washed us clean through his dying on the cross, through his rising from the grave. But you see, the Pharisees were focusing on religion rather than relationship. And they're two very different things. Religion is, is focused on us trying to get to God. What can I do to achieve that connection? Where actually the relationship that is freely available is already focused on our connection with God. And it's here for us. But, but it's all about the heart behind it, right? God wants a relationship with us. Uh, and, and just as our relationships with, with close friends or siblings might result in us treating them nicely and with care in most instances, um, you know, Jesus said in John 14 that if you love me, keep my commands. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them in their hearts. In this day and age, we've, we've maybe come to think that, that love is, you know, allowing or should allow us to, to just live out our truth and be who we want or need to be or who we feel to be. And sure, that can be true. But agape love, the love that God shows us, that unconditional, undeserved love, is also selfless. And selflessly, we should connect with the love language of the other person, right? In this case, that, that love language is, is obedience, obedience to God's commands. And just as he wanted from, from Adam in the Garden of Eden, you know, here in the passage, Jesus is challenging the Pharisees to see that their hearts are obviously in the wrong place because they're not actually even obeying God's word or his commands out of love, even when it comes to taking care of their own father or mother. You know, in verse 3, Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father or mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. And this is slightly odd, but the elders and Pharisees had basically created some small print that, that allowed people to hoard their possessions and, and not take care of their parents or even their wider family if they could say that their land or their property or whatever it was, was devoted to God. And I was really interested because it didn't mean they had to give those things to God or to the church or to the temple. They could still keep them, but they would use them for their own gain, for their own enjoyment, rather than sharing with others. And now you can imagine that Jesus is questioning, you know, where's the heart in that? You know, how, how do we as individuals respond to those around us who are in need? You know, it, it doesn't even need to be financially, but, but do we lend a helping hand when, when someone needs support or, or, or needs you to help them move house or, or take care of the kids maybe just for a night or a week? Or maybe not a week, that's quite long. <laughs> But, but how do we as a church react when, when we come across the homeless or destitute? You know, I'm always so inspired and encouraged by the work that goes on during the night shelter season, you know, especially in the winter when, when we come together and fill up the rotor super quickly uh, to lend uh, an overnight stay or, or support with dinner. You know, people give their time and resources to those in need. But how can we make it a year-long thing? How can we do it on a daily basis? How, how can we touch someone with a random act of kindness once a day or once a week to show God's love? What can we do to go further, get involved, get our hands dirty? You know, Jesus is more fussed about our clean hearts than so-called clean hands. You hypocrites, Jesus continued in verse 7. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. 
These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Jesus had no time for lip service, right? no time for hypocrisy. He would rather see the Pharisees and, and us now make no effort at all rather than pretending to honor and worship God uh, whilst our hearts were really focused on upholding man-made rules and traditions. You know? Jesus called to the crowd in verse 10 and said, listen and understand what goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Wow. Now, to defile means to, to damage the purity of something, right? So, uh, Jesus is warning that it's not the food that you eat with unwashed hands that affects your purity. It might affect your internal health and cleanliness. Um, but here, Jesus clarifies that it's what comes back out of your mouth that reflects where you are. It does way more to demonstrate where you're at in relation to God. So, we have to watch what we do. We have to watch what we say. Uh, in another passage in Matthew 12, Jesus said, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. You can tell when someone's heart is glad because they speak positively and with joy. You can tell when someone has a gracious heart because they're kind about other people and they pay them compliments. These are the kind of heart postures we're encouraged to have, you know, rather than the type that actually defiles. In verse 12, then the disciples came to him and asked, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? And he replied, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both fall into a pit. So knowing that the Pharisees were not at this point in time the best guides, Jesus is warning that we actually need to be throughout time wise and discerning about where we get our life advice from and you know it goes straight into your heart and, and ultimately affects how we behave it affects what comes out of us again so ask yourself you know is what i'm hearing biblical or is it just logical which is not necessarily the same thing right a lot of the so-called wisdom that, that we glean from from here and there is actually rooted in the word of god which is great um you know, even if you look at a lot of the legal frameworks that operate in the world today, many of them can, go, can be dated back to, to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 through to, verse, to chapter 7. You know, a lot of our modern morality is exactly what Jesus was teaching at the time in his day to those around him. You know, it, it was what Jesus, the Son of God, uh, word become flesh. He was sharing this all whilst he was on this earth. Now, he is a great source of wisdom. And so anyone else not planted by his heavenly father can be seen as a blind guide. And that just means that, that anyone giving advice needs to be rooted in the word of God. Otherwise, it's the blind leading the blind and everyone, leads, everyone ends up in a pit. And that's not to suggest that there isn't, you know, interesting and helpful information out there that, that can, you know, guide us and help us with things in life all the time. You know, I've been a fan of um, Stephen Bartlett's Diary of a CEO podcast for, for quite a few years now. And he gets some amazing guests from the worlds of business and sport and culture to, to come on and talk about their life experiences, the learnings they've had and all those things. And there's some juicy bits in there um, and definitely stuff that can help us prevent you know, avoid making the same mistakes that, that someone might have made before us. All very useful. But I also feel challenged to hear and filter the nuggets shared through the lens of God's word, right? And it's particularly God's, Jesus' teachings. You know, so is life really all about working hard all hours and striving for the next goal? Or is it also about learning to trust God? and lean on him and, and know that his will will come to fruition. I know in my life, the times where, where I've tried to force something or, or you know, it seemed like the right and pertinent or, or business savvy thing to do, uh, God has often shut it down because it didn't fit with his will. I think there's a real peace to be found in accepting that God's will shall be done. It doesn't mean we don't try and work hard and, and make an effort, but it should mean that we listen for his leading, which is best actually done through prayer. 
In Psalm 25, King David prays, guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. And so similarly, you know, relationships and dating and marriage can be a hot topic these days, but, but on that podcast and, and lots of other places, but is what we're hearing from social commentators really the right way to do it? You know, are we really supposed to just date endlessly for, for the purpose of finding the one whilst, whilst actually really maybe just fulfilling our own needs and desires? Or are we called to be super intentional about who we date and, and seek to do lifeless, but with a selfless heart? You know, a friend once said to me that if you're not dating for marriage and, and that union, then you're actually dating to break up at some point. And, and that can leave pain, and trauma, and baggage that, that takes years to recover from. But we're taught in the Bible that love is patient, and love is kind. It, it doesn't dishonor others, you know? It's not self-seeking. The Bible is where I would take relationship advice from. And there's, there's a whole other topic that we probably need a whole sermon series on. Um, but, but we can't let the ideas out there in the world overshadow the purity of God's word and his guidance. And one last slightly more extreme example, but, but, but Andrew Tate is having a huge impact on particularly the young men. Yeah, I'm going there. I'm going there today. I'm going there today. Today, we're going there today. Yeah. And he's having a huge impact, particularly on young men and young boys who, who understand that some of what he says kind of makes sense. You know, work hard, get money, stay fit. I can see where that's coming from. But just as the traditions of the elders in the New Testament and the Old Testament were, you know, along the right line, wash your hands before you eat, uh, you also have to filter what can be problematic. You have to filter what's maybe not with the best intention because it's often interwoven in the positive messages. So I encourage you, don't let anyone teach you, even from this stage, without holding it up against the word of God and checking what we say. You know, some Bibles often have red letters for what Jesus said. I think those red letters are the most important pieces of information in the Bible because they're straight from Jesus' mouth. And that's where the truest and greatest wisdom for life can be found. And if you aren't sure, check your heart. Has what you heard from whoever it might be left you encouraged to be more pure and Christ-like? Or has it left you feeling like you might be defiled? Or what comes out of you might be defiling? In verse 15, Peter said, explain the parable to us. <laughs> Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then boop, out of the body? <laughs> but the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart and these defile them. Are you still so dull? Gosh. Now, at this point, I'm starting to think that Jesus might have had a Nigerian grandparent. <laughs> All right? Somewhere in his blood. It must be on his mother's side, obviously. But somewhere, there must be a Nigerian coming through. Because if you know about Nigerians, we love this technique, which is actually called, I found out, it's called myutics. All right? And myutics is a technique used to question someone and teach someone by asking them a question in response to their question. Nigerians do this every day of the week, all the time. Like, like if you've grown up in a Nigerian household or maybe even a, a general African household, you've probably had this conversation at some point. Mom, dad, whichever, why can't I go out and, you know, spend all night in the streets with my friends and just play out after dark and da 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 and the response will typically be, do your friends live here? Are they my concern? If you're lucky, you might get something more along the lines of like, outside there is London, inside here is Lagos. <laughs> and the rules are different. That, that's the best you might get. But often it will just be question responded by with a question. But actually, that was similar to what the Jewish people did at the time. They would often respond to each other with questions as part of their debate to draw out more of the insights that they were looking for. Um, but even knowing that, I'm going to push the Nigerian Jesus theory. Anyway. <laughs> but verse 19, for, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, 
murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. But eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. Okay, so here's the life application that Jesus was getting at the whole time. The disciples are not getting it, so he has to make it plain. Out of the heart come evil thoughts. These are what defile a person. These are the thoughts that make us impure. And in fairness, we could all sometimes play a bit dumb like the disciples at times. You know, the Bible can be very clear on a topic, but we think, hmm, is that what it really says? Is there a different meaning to that? You know, I've definitely played that game in the past. It, it will say, flee every appearance of evil. Mm, maybe I'll just hang around there. Lead us not into temptation. We're supposed to pray. Yet we can find ourselves in places and situations that are inevitably going to lead us to wrongdoing and sin, which can be harmful to ourselves and those around us and definitely affect our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Because remember, this Christ life, this Christ-like life that we're called to pursue is about way more than behaving in a way that is just acceptable to the outside world. You know, look at, look at that list, for example, adultery, sexual immorality, which could be called promiscuity, lying, slander, and gossip. <laughs> These are all commonplace in the world that we live in today, pretty much accepted as social norms. But that's not the standard of Jesus, right? He calls us to higher. He warns that our hearts need to be firmly rooted in the right place, in the word of God, to ensure that we don't defile ourselves. We should constantly be checking our hearts that they're in line with Jesus all the time, no matter what it relates to. Let's give you a small example. Um, part of my spiritual journey, I've, I've come to hate getting angry. Um, I hate shouting, and like unless it's a righteous indignation, like Jesus turning the tables in the temple, uh, then I'm doing too much and it's unnecessary. And the Bible says, in your anger, do not sin, right? So confession time I'm still on my way but I'm reminded of a time on a Sunday afternoon after church can you believe it um, I went to pick up some food from a restaurant and uh, got home opened it up realized they had messed up my order left some stuff out great had to go back to the restaurant make a complaint ask for what I needed as it was coming out said okay that's nice and how about my compensation you know I know my rights I'm a consumer what have you got for me? And this is what they offered. <laughs> a bottle of Fanta. Is that it? I mean, in fairness, I don't know if you know this Fanta, but it's, it comes in a glass bottle because it is very sweet. So it's quite delicious. But a bottle of Fanta, come on, what is this? I lost it. I demanded to speak to the manager. I'm going to make a complaint. I'm going to leave a Google review. I'm going to do all this stuff. Da, 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 da. And eventually I got a bit more out of them, which was, which was nice. But walking out, I felt terrible. Like I could literally feel in my heart like it was impure and it shouldn't have happened and it wasn't the way I was supposed to have behaved. You know, was this what Jesus would have done? Was this the way that we're encouraged or led to behave, especially not wanting to act out of anger? You know, I definitely knew that God was still doing a work in my heart because he wants us to be different. We're called to be salt and light. You know, interactions with us as Christ followers should, should taste different. They should be hard to ignore. They, they should be impossible to overshadow. As in John 1, it says that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. You know, what is okay for the world living in darkness is not okay for us. So how can we keep our hearts in check? I thought you'd never ask. Just two points to encourage you with. The first one is to guard your heart. Now, we know that the evil thoughts are based on what is already in our hearts. So that means we need to be careful what we allow in in the first place, right? You know, Proverbs 4 is an amazing passage about wisdom. And it has a few verses which speak to what we're talking about right now. So from verse 23, it says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free of perversity, keep corrupt talk far from your lips. You know, we need to watch what we say. We need to speak positively, speak life, build people up, don't gossip, don't badmouth people. 
think if you would be happy for the person that you're talking about to hear what you're saying about them. The energy we put into negative speech undoubtedly has an impact on the state of our hearts. And so instead, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, as Paul wrote to the Colossians. Then in that passage in Proverbs, verse 25 says, let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. Now, as grown adults, it can be easy for us to think that we're no longer impressionable or easily influenced by what's going on around us. But you just need to look at the way that politics plays out, the way that politicians and parties can have an impact. You know, it still blows my mind that hundreds of people could be so convinced about something that they were willing to storm their own Capitol building to see a decision overturned. Grown adults. Knowing that, these verses advising us to guard our hearts and keep our gaze di fixed directly in front uh, encourage us not to be distracted by ideologies or politics or whatever's going on that could take us off course. You know, summed up by this, this little image that, that, you know, what you see, what you say, what you do, uh, what you hear, it all impacts the health of your heart and out of your heart then everything flows. The times I've been furthest from God have been the times where I've allowed my heart to be influenced by what was going on around me or by other inputs. You know, I got to the point of having to stop listening to hip hop and R&B music because it was just having too much of a negative impact on me. You know, as much as I love Jay-Z and Beyonce, it, it just left my heart focused on the life and the lifestyle that those artists cared about and um, put out in their music rather than what God cares about. You know, did I want my heart to be full of aggression or, or those feelings? Or did I want it to be full of the joy and peace that comes when I listen to, to worship and gospel music? If you're an S Club 7 fan, slightly different. <laughs> Similarly, I've had to stop watching TV shows or, or films that, that normalize violence and murder and adultery and, and uh, theft and false testimony and slander. You know, and, and to say that in this day and age of freedom and free will is, is maybe slightly contrarian. It might sound extreme, but we are called to be extremely different. We are called to guard our hearts. Instead of filling them with, with uh, what's out there, we should fill them with God's word, which is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. I hope this is making sense. It did in my head. But I'll ask the band to come up as I close. So to check or keep a check on our heart health, we obviously need to guard our heart and then we also need to search your heart. Now we as a, as a church typically start the year with a month of prayer in January uh, and this year was an especially wonderful time of strengthening connections and relationship with God and those around us, particularly through prayer. Uh, and we had an amazing journey through a book that I know a lot of us were reading at the time, um, and I hope it's still being passed around, but Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools uh, uh, by Tyler Statton, really good book. This is not a book giveaway today, I'm sorry, but <laughs> you'll have to go and get your own. Um, but, but the book talks about various aspects of prayer that help us to have the right heart posture before God. And, and one of these is actually deep excavation in confession, right? Um, so I'm going to read a passage from the book, I think it's page 83. Um, but this has really challenged me as, as I was preparing for this. One of the biggest mistakes we've made in the ch modern church is to reimagine spiritual maturity as the need to confess less. The unspoken assumption is, as I ascend in relationship with God, I confess less because I have less to confess. True spiritual maturity, though, is the opposite. It's not an ascension, it's an archaeological dig as we discover layer after layer of what was in us all along. Spiritual maturity means more confession, not less. Maturity is discovering the depths of my personal brand of fallenness and the depths to which God's grace has really penetrated, even without me knowing it. 
The desperate need of our time is, is not for successful Christians, popular Christians, or winsome Christians. It's for deep Christians. And the only way to become a deep Christian is through the inner excavation called confession. The pathway of spiritual maturity is a descent, not an ascent. A maturing community is a confessing community. Not a church without sin, but a church without secrets. Mind blown. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 139. This prompts us to challenge the thinking behind everything we do. You know, as, as you sit on the train and, and stare at the, the guy or girl opposite you, you know, are you gazing on their beauty and thanking God for his creation? Or, or is there some lust in your heart? Uh, a heart posture that can lead to adultery or sexual immorality. When you're discussing your friend or colleague, you know, are you just expressing an opinion on their behavior? Or is it verging on gossip or slander? You know, was, was that big meal and, and all those drinks that you put through on expenses really for work purposes? Or are you finding a cheeky way to, to sneak a bit out of our company? You search your heart through deeper and deeper confession to know if there is more work for God to do in you. I can guarantee the answer is yes. But which of these two do you, do you need to focus on the most this week? Is it guarding your heart or, or searching your heart? I would really challenge you to even just focus on one of the two, you know? Maybe you want to even come for prayers right now and, and see if there's something that God wants to reveal to you. As we, as we bring the service to a close, you'll be able to go across or, or you can stay here and worship uh, and pray and reflect. I've got a clear time today. Our Heavenly Father wants to meet us at our point of, meet, a point of need, no matter where that is. So please, do take some time this week to check your heart health. Let me pray for us as we close. Father God, thank you that we don't have to follow traditions, but simply follow your commands, which are all for our good. I pray that you would fulfill us with a longing and a desire to be more like your son, Jesus. Do a new work in our hearts, we pray, that we might be planted in your word and only speak truths that are pleasing to you and bring light and goodness to those around us. Amen.